time I saw you, but I've been in and out as well, and it's good to have everyone else here. So um, as we prepare to worship, let's get our hearts ready to, uh, to worship the Lord and allow Nathaniel to, to lead us in song um, as we spend this next hour or so worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. Can we that love the Lord and let our joys be known? Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. And thus around the throne, and thus surround the throne. Who are marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion, we're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God, but children of the heavenly King, but children of the heavenly King, may speak their joys abroad, may speak their joys abroad. Who are marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Then let our songs abound and every tear be dry. Who are marching through Emmanuel's ground. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground to fairer worlds on high, to fairer worlds on high. Who are marching to Zion, a beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear falling on my ear The Son of God discloses And He walks with me and He talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. He speaks, and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing in the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own And the joy we share as we tarry there None other has ever Beautiful. 
faithful beyond description, too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the depth of your love? You are beautiful beyond description. Majesty enthroned above. And I stand, I stand in all of you. I stand, I stand in all of you. Holy God, you, all praises do I stand in all of you. You are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension. Like nothing ever seen or heard Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the depth of your love? You are beautiful beyond description Majesty enthroned above and I stand, I stand in all of you. I stand, I stand in all of you. Holy God, do all praise is due. I stand in all of you. Hey Amen. Let's take a few moments to greet our neighbors.
Shall we pray, brothers and sisters? And Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us once again to gather to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, your son Jesus said that the love we have for our brothers and sisters will proclaim to the world that we are your disciples, as it is, as it is written in John 13, 34. Please deepen our love for one another and make us eager to maintain the unity of the spirit as it is written in Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 3. Help us to care for all and not showing favoritism. Father, please help us to put others first and seek to use the spiritual gifts you have graciously entrusted us with to build up others. Guide us in our interactions so others are blessed and you are glorified. Father, focus our hearts and minds on the mission you have for us to share the gospel and make disciples of Christ. Father, use our time as you gather, as your gathered body to bless us and send us out for ministering your gospel and the power of your spirit to our broken world. May the Lord add a blessing to the hearers and doers of his word. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely. Altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. King of all days, oh, so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all full of sank became poor. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross i'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross so here i am to worship here i am to bow down here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you.
Before we take part in this great memorial, this great act of remembrance of the Lord's Supper, I want to read from the book of Hebrews, chapter 7, verse 25. Usually with remembrances, there's uh, just a remembrance of someone that's passed where the person's remembered, but there's really no longer any effect they're having on the lives of others, other than in the minds and in the memories and the reflections that the family or friends may have of the person that's passed on. But when we remember Jesus with the Lord's Supper, the remembrance is not of someone who's passed that we just have fond memories of, but it's a powerful remembrance of who we are and what we were made to be and what Christ is presently doing and what he's going to continue to do for us as the one who died for us is not still in the ground, but it sits at the right hand of God to make intercession for us. The writer of Hebrews captures it this way in verse 25 of chapter 7. Speaking of Jesus, he says, Therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, since he always lives to intercede for them. One of the biggest worries of early Christians was, what about the sin after I've been baptized? How does Christ's death affect me then? Scripture tells us, not only in this place and another place, Jesus places Jesus' death continues to have a powerful effect. As we confess our sins, as John tells us to do in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, all based on this ongoing benefit of Christ's sacrifice. He ever lives to make intercession for us. So when we confess our sins to God, we take those to the Father in prayer, Jesus intercedes or he acts as a go-between and tells the Father, I've forgiven them based on my death on their behalf and their confession of what we both already know they sinned. So he ever lives to make intercession. So therefore he saves completely those who come to the Father through him. So what we celebrate this morning is being saved completely. That's how we can face tomorrow. That's how we can face the next sin. It's knowing we've been forgiven through Jesus Christ. It will just confess those sins. So this is no usual memorial. This is a memorial of someone who's alive and well and is actively working in our lives and will till the day that we die. What a great blessing. What a great opportunity to remember what he does for us. Let's go ahead and go to our Father in prayer and thank him for how he wants us to remember him. Almighty and great God, holy is your name. You are from everlasting to everlasting. You had no beginning and you have no end. And you are the one constant in our lives and we bow down before you. And at this moment in time, in a great gratitude for something we still don't fully understand, that is your love for us and the magnitude of your son's sacrifice on our behalf. But we accept it, Father, based on what you've told us you've done for us. And we thank you, Father, for helping us to actively remember what you've done through this remembrance of your son's body through the unleavened bread and your son's blood through this grape juice that takes us very personally to the fact that your son died for us, and it's through your grace that we are saved, and that not of ourselves. Help us at this very moment, Father, to put everything else out and to remember what you've done, what you are doing, and what you will do for us through your Son. This we pray through your Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. The elements are in the back in the little container, and you may go ahead.
God his son not sparing sent him to die I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin and sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art and sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art when christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then i shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my god how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art and sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great Many times in scripture, so much is captured in such a short verse, just like we saw in Hebrews 7, verse 25. I want to now reflect on 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, because this verse captures the attitude that God's looking for whenever we give. In just a moment, there's an opportunity to give either online through texting or the church website, or if you have a cash or check gift, you can put that in the back. But here's what the Holy Spirit tells the Apostle Paul to share with believers about how we give. Paul writes, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver cheerful giver exactly ricardo and others you recognized before we even got there god's not looking for anyone that gives out of guilt there's not any instruction that tells a church to exact a certain amount from its uh, congregation Uh, the only requirement is simply to give as we've decided to give and to make sure that's clear it's not to be reluctantly or under any kind of compulsion For God simply loves a cheerful gift. He has no use for guilt gifts. He doesn't want you giving to impress others. He just wants you cheerful about what you are giving. It's your decision. And at this time, if you um, have a gift to give, the baskets are in the back, or you can otherwise give as you're directed.
Let's stand for the song before the lesson. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy your name, Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name, worthy is your name, worthy Whoops, just put that there. Okay, how's my voice? Sounds good, okay. So our study verses for today are gonna be in Matthew chapter 25, verses one through 13. Um, so let's start with a reading first. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bri bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. So let me just give you some context of, of where we are. 
So this takes place on the Mount of Olives. It's just outside of the city of Jerusalem, and it actually has a vantage point over the city. And you can see kind of the, the square there, and this just above center, that's, that's the temple. And then actually in between the Mount of Olives and the temple is the Garden of Gethsemane, kind of in, in a valley there. And this, this parable is considered an, an apocalyptic parable, and it's part of what scholars call the Olivet Discourse. Um, and the entire all of that discourse is about the signs and the consequences of Jesus' return. Um, so prior to this parable, Jesus talks about the abomination of desolation. Uh, he gives the lesson of the fig tree. And he also talks about the coming of the Son of Man. And then that's followed by the parable of the talents and then what Jesus says about Judgment Day itself. So in, in order to understand this parable, I want to I try to put us in the mindset of a, of a first century Galilean. And, and the reason we want to try to put ourselves in the mindset of a first century Galilean is because the Lord Jesus Christ grew up in Galilee. I'll pull up a map for you here. Um, so you see Galilee is, is north of Jerusalem. And you can see Nazareth just a little bit to the south, uh, southern portion of, of Galilee. And most of Jesus' chosen 12 disciples were from Ga the Galilee, except for Judas Iscariot, who may have been from a town that was south of Jerusalem. So let me just give you a little, another map here just for perspective. I know Michael had mentioned that Jerusalem was about 80 miles away from, from the Sea of Galilee uh, in one of his previous lessons. So you see there's a bit, a bit of a distance there. Um, so some of the information that we're going to go over today uh, was mentioned in a book called the, the Best Day of Forever by Pastor Jay McCarl, um, which was published in 2012, but it's, it's now out of print. And then uh, some of the supplemental information comes from commentaries that, are, that are, were written in the last 80 years or so. But ever since the destruction of the Jewish temple in 70 AD by the Romans, the, and the Jews were dispersed after that throughout the entire Roman Empire, there's, there, there, the scholars and some of the commentaries and Pastor McCarl have found some commonalities in what they call the Galilean wedding or Galilean um, wedding feast or, or ceremony. But most of it will be, is, uh, some of it is interesting uh, and, and some of it could be speculation at best. Um, first off, we know from this passage that a marriage feast is going to take place. And first century Galilean weddings were, were a pretty big deal. And everyone in town knew that, that there was going to be a wedding that was going to take place. And if you remember from our lesson on Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus, first you have the betrothal and then about a year later you have the marriage and the wedding feast. And during that one-year period, the bridegroom would continue to, to work or learn a trade um, if he didn't have one. And then he'd also build an extension to his father's house because that's where he and his bride would live. And if that sounds like the Lord Jesus Christ saying, in my father's house there are many rooms and I go to prepare a place for you, that's possibly where the analogy came from. Um, and so when the marriage actually took place a year later, was a mystery because the only person who could decide when that marriage ceremony and the wedding feast was going to take place is the bridegroom's father. The, the son could ask his father every day, I'd like to go get my bride, and the father could say no. And for various reasons, whether the son hasn't finished the room that he's building onto his father's house, or maybe he just hasn't saved up enough money yet because typically after the marriage, the son would be allowed to take a year off from labor in order to spend that with his wife. Um, and if that, if, if that delay calls to mind also that no one knows the day or the hour of the son's return but the father, it's possible that's where that analogy comes from as well. Um, but eventually the father would make a decision um, that the wedding is going to take place that night and he'll wake up his son and, the, and his groomsmen are staying with him. He'll wake up his son and he'll, and he'll say, son, it's time, go and get your bride. And so they'll head out of the father's house and this is where we'll pick things up for the first verse. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. So some translations will have bridesmaids instead of virgins, but the Greek word is parthenos, which does mean virgins, and it's probably a better translation based on the context and meaning of this parable. So the, this calls to mind, well, why, why ten virgins? Why not twelve? Why not three? Because those are numbers we're familiar with. Um, and to the, to the Jews of that time, and even before that, the number 10 meant perfection. So if you think 10 commandments, 
you think the ten plagues on Egypt. And also, if you remember the lesson on Lydia, ten Jewish men, ten heads of households were needed to form a synagogue, and ten were needed in order to read from the Torah. So that's the significance of the number ten. So the ten virgins, they take their lamps because they know, per Galilean wedding customs, that the bridegroom will come at night. And so they're going out to meet the bridegroom with their lamps lit. And some ancient tradition suggests that the, the, the virgins would provide a, a lighted procession for the bridegroom and they would dance along the way, along this processional route. And the lamps during that time, um, they could have been small bowls. Uh, another, tr another interpretation is that they could have been torches or that were hung as well that were carried around. Um, but it's possible it was also a, either a copper bowl or, a, uh, or made of pottery material and then it had a wick inside it and it was filled with typically olive oil. So moving on to the next verse. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. So in the first verse, we, we can assume that all 10 of the virgins basically dress alike and talk alike. Maybe they're part of the same synagogue. Maybe they worship together at the same synagogue. They all sing the, same, the psalms together, and they serve regularly. So there's no way to actually tell the difference between them. And, and the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't say that the virgins are good or bad. He says that they're foolish and they're wise because the foolish were foolish because they showed up unprepared. And the wise were wise because they became prepared for what could be a very long night. So the foolish, they weren't thinking about the future. They, they only saw what was going on at that moment, maybe going through the heads right now is, well, I mean, I, I've got enough oil to last through the night uh, and, and it'll last all the way past midnight if the bridegroom even shows up tonight. And, and besides, I was busy today. I didn't have time to get extra oil. And there's always tomorrow because the bridegroom may not come tonight. He probably won't. Whereas the wise, were a little more thoughtful, and that's what the Greek word used for wise actually means. It means thoughtful. They always thought of having extra oil, just in case. That little extra supply, just in case the wick sucked up more oil than it normally does, and, and maybe they knew exactly how much, t how much t burn time they had in that lamp. And so this is actually, this is a replica of what the lamp may look like. It's about four inches long. You can get it off of Amazon, which is where I ended up getting it. Um, and I actually tested this lamp. I put olive oil in it, I put a wick in it, and the burn time for, for the wick before it started to smoke was about three hours. And then by the time there was, wasn't enough oil in there, it was probably about six hours, so definitely not enough time to last through the night. And traditionally, the oil was a symbol of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's the Holy Spirit who continually opens our eyes to the Word of God, and we know that from our study of Lydia. And understanding the Word of God leads to obedience, and obedience leads to faith, which we learned in our study of Naaman. Faith leads to salvation. Faith leads to a godly righteousness. Faith leads your actions being a reflection of, of Jesus' character. Um, it, but it's not, it's not perfection because reflections are not perfect. Uh, complete perfection is, is it's humanly impossible to attain, but constant improvement through the regeneration of the Holy Spirit is possible to attain if you allow it. So the oil serves also as a, as a metaphor for a person's righteousness. The foolish ones, they don't have enough of it. And so ultimately pulling all of these elements together, what the oil represents is a person's true spiritual state. That is the Holy Spirit and the person's righteousness or lack thereof. So the level of oil in your lamp would indicate the level or the quality of your faith. And for some, in the, in, for some in, in the church today, their lamps are really low on oil. And probably for just as many, their lamps are empty. Because if we as professing Christians are not filled with the Holy Spirit, then we're just an empty lamp. And a lamp that doesn't serve its purpose in the dark of night is worthless. Um, there, there were hardly any street lamps there in, in ancient Jerusalem or ancient Capernaum or ancient Nazareth. Uh, you may, you, maybe you could see a little light seeping under the door of a home or maybe around the windowsill, but that was about it. Otherwise, it was dark. 
And to, for us to neglect the oil is like neglecting the Spirit of God. So the, the Holy Spirit is still, to this day, considered a, a, a for, forgotten part of the Trinity because he's trying to change people's hearts and make them more like Christ, but he's ignored by many because many people don't want to change. So moving on to the next verse. Now, while the bridegroom was delayed, they all began to nod off and they fell asleep. So all of them fell asleep, not just the foolish and not just the wise. Everyone fell asleep. The waiting made them tired. The, the excitement wore out after midnight. Then the drowsiness sets in, they start nodding off and sleep takes over. Just like Peter, James, and John in the Garden of Gethsemane. The, they accompany the Lord Jesus Christ there and he goes to pray and he comes back and he finds them sleeping. And we're, we're all conditioned by society, dislike waiting, uh, especially in this age of instant gratification, but God is not on our timetable. And we don't know why the bridegroom was delayed, but perhaps Jesus is delayed even now because he wants to continue to test the faith of the faithful. Because the longer Jesus delays his return, the easier it will be to see who's faithful and who's not. And there, there, this, it, this passage doesn't say that there's anything wrong with physical sleep. Our bodies need the rest. But Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ wants us to be spiritually awake and spiritually alert and spiritually ready for his return, regardless of what your physical condition is. Uh, many of you know I'm, I'm not a parent, but for those of you who are or, or were, um, you know what it's like to be asleep and then your newborn baby cries and instantly you get up right away and you're at their side. But sometimes as the months start to drag on, there's a tendency to become a little complacent. They cry because they want something. They're hungry. You're tired. They don't have a set sleep pattern. You don't even remember what sleep is. And soon you're a little slower to get up when they cry. So we all get spiritually sleepy. Uh, we often get wrapped up in frivolous things and even legitimate concerns like family, like friends, like our health, like work. Uh, but sometimes those concerns cause us to be spiritually low uh, because, and because we have to take time to deal with them. But we can't neglect to build up our spiritual reservoir through personal time with God's word and asking the Holy Spirit to help us understand it. Without both, we start to become spiritually less awake. And so they've fallen asleep. But at midnight, there was a shout, Look, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins got up and put their own lamps in order, trimmed the wicks, and added oil and lit them. But the foolish virgins said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, because our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No. Otherwise, there will not be enough for us and for you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy oil for yourselves. So according to Jewish wedding tradition, after the father makes a decision for the son to go get his bride, um, the, the bridegroom and his groomsmen, someone will grab a shofar and they'll go to the roof of the house and they'll just start to blow it. And that starts to wake up everyone in town. Then they will snake their way through town, blowing the shofar, and the people who are ready for the wedding feast will come out of their homes and they'll join the procession. And they'll follow that procession to the bride's home. And the procession, again, will pass by every single home and those who are ready will, will come out and they'll, and they'll eventually end up at, at the bride's home. And the bridesmaid's job is typically to stand there with their lamps lit and follow the bridegroom as he takes his bride back to his father's house. And again, the bridesmaid's responsibility, the, the ones who were there anyway, uh, is to light the way for the procession uh, along the route. The only thing is, and, and you've probably noticed it already, that the bride isn't even mentioned in this parable at all. There's no mention of a bride. It's the bridegroom and the ten virgins. So this parable isn't about ten virgins and uh, representing the kingdom of heaven. This, this parable is, is solely about those who were invited to the marriage feast, so that's those of us who've heard the gospel. And it's about those who accepted the wedding invitation, so that's, that means those of us who made a commitment to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And all ten of these virgins know it's their responsibility to meet the bridegroom with lamps lit and to follow him. 
And in these four verses, we, we, will act, we actually have our confirmation as to what separates the foolish from the wise because in the preceding verses, there's actually no way to tell the difference. F physically, if we were there, visually, we would never be able to tell the difference. But here we read, because we read that they were all awakened by someone announcing the coming of the bridegroom. They all knew to get their lamps in order by trimming the wicks and filling the reservoir with oil and then lighting or relighting their lamps. So the wise ones brought extra oil to last the entire night because they considered the possibility that they may run out. And so they were able to reignite or, or reawaken their faith on their own. But since the foolish ones didn't have enough oil in their lamps, they try to borrow from the other five. And this is how it is for those who don't have a genuine faith. They try to get it from someone or from somewhere else. Hey, I, 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 need, this, I need this from you, brother. Can you, can you help me, sister? Tell me again what, what we're supposed to believe. Tell me the important things that we're supposed to say. Maybe you can talk to the bridegroom for me and, and let him know that you know, we're, we're, we're together. Maybe he'll let us in together because I'm in with you, even if my lamp is going out. And, but the answer that they get is, no, you need to get your own faith. If I try to have faith for you and me, I'm going to run out long before the night is done. You have to go and find your own faith. You have to grow your own faith on your own and hope that it's not too late. But for the five foolish virgins, it, it was too late because they run away or they run off hoping that they can reawaken what's died inside of them or get what they had very little of or, or didn't have in the first place. And while they're away, but while they were going away to buy oil, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut and locked. So the church body is known for almost 2,000 years now that Jesus is coming back. So, so there's no excuse to be unprepared. There's no excuse now for any of the virgins to be unprepared. But the foolish are running around looking for oil to buy, and they're, they're trying to find that one bit of faith that they should have had beforehand, but it's too late. And, and besides, would, would a dealer even be open that late at night for them to buy oil? But for the wise, they were ready, and they followed the bridegroom to the wedding feast. And so he leads them in a procession, um, all of those who've been prepared, all of those who are prepared to meet the bridegroom. And they all go into the wedding feast, and the door is shut, never to be opened again. And according to Galilean wedding tradition, once the door is shut, no one could get in and out for seven days. That's how long the party lasted, seven days of feasting. In, and I, I see some of you are starting to panic about seven days of eating. That, that can sound kind of daunting for some, or if you like food, then you know, that's, that's a great place to be. But it, it, was, it was, so that, that's the one commonality that, that is known about Jewish wedding, the wedding feast, is that back then the door was shut and everyone partied for seven days. And if you were outside, you were not getting in. And if you were inside, you weren't getting out, but more than likely you were having so much fun you wouldn't want to leave anyway. Later, the others also came and said, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he replied, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, I do not know you. We have no relationship. Therefore, be on, al on the alert. Be prepared and ready, for you do not know the day nor the hour when the Son of Man will come. So we're not told if the foolish virgins were able to actually get any oil, whether they were, they able, they were able to buy any or not. And we don't even know how late they were to arrive, maybe just a few minutes but they've arrived at the main entrance and they can't get in. They hear all the feasting going on inside and all the partying, but the door is now locked. And so the foolish virgins say, Lord, Lord. So that, that, during that time, that was the way of addressing someone in an endearing manner. It was through the repetition of their name. So we, we see this type of repetition in the New Testament about a half a dozen times. And, and it was a cultural way by, by the Jews of addressing someone who you were on intimate terms with. Just like in Matthew chapter 23, verse 37, when Jesus weeps over Jerusalem, and this is actually before he begins his Olivet Discourse, he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. And also in Luke chapter 22, verse 3, just before Jesus tells Peter that Peter will deny him three times, 
he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you like wheat. And also in Luke's gospel account, chapter 10, starting in verse 37, when Jesus is at the home of, of Lazarus and Mary and Martha, and Martha's busy preparing a meal, but Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet listening to him. And Martha complains, and Jesus addresses her in an endearing way. Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. So the foolish virgins say, Lord, Lord, as an appeal to Jesus. And they're saying the right thing, the right way, but Jesus is not moved by what they're saying. Because of foolish virgins, they, they have the language of a believer in Christ, but not the character of one who believes in Christ. And while they have a voice that may profess Christ, they don't have a heart that longs to follow Christ. They didn't join in the procession to the wedding feast. They didn't follow the bridegroom, the bridegroom to the wedding feast. So no wonder Jesus doesn't know them because they weren't following him. Knowing about Jesus, as we all know, is not the same as following Jesus. And almost all the practitioners of, of all the world's religions know of Jesus. They think of him as a great man. They think of him as a great prophet. And they think of him as this significant historical figure who founded one of the three great religions to come out of the Near East. But what they ignore is that Jesus is God because once you begin to, to believe and talk about Jesus being God, then he is something, uh, he is someone that you have to answer to. And that's a scary proposition for a lot of people. They don't want to answer to Jesus. They don't want to acknowledge him as God because then you have to answer to him. You have to do exactly what he says. And there are people, obviously, th those same people are the ones who would rather be in control of their own lives instead of handing control over to Jesus. And while they're busy trying to control their own lives, the bridegroom has come and passed them by and left them behind. So when the Lord Jesus Christ says to the foolish virgins, I do not know you, this is an actual picture of what it will be like on Judgment Day. And these are words no one wants to hear because that means separation from God. It means the door will be shut forever and those five virgins and those with them and those who are like them will spend the rest of eternity outside in the darkness wishing that they had been prepared. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes, you'll either be among the prepared or the unprepared. You'll either be known by him or you, you won't, you'll be unknown by him. So you have to watch and you have to start getting prepared because you don't know the day or the hour when Jesus will reappear. So I'll give you four lessons that we can learn from the prepared and the unprepared and there'll be three questions afterwards. So the first lesson is that each of us is a lamp that bears witness to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we as lamps, we, we light the way like the city on a hill or, or a light in the world, but, but remember that we reflect the light of Christ. We don't generate it on our own because, of, because Jesus is, light, is the light. And the Holy Spirit is oil. The Holy Spirit is the fuel that fuels the light. And he gives us that fuel to burn to show Jesus' character and to testify of Jesus' salvation to the world. But every time our witness is for ourselves instead of for Christ, then the light of the lamp grows dim. Every time we bathe in the attention of fame and popularity and power, the light gets dim. Every time we crave something that belongs to someone else, every time we intentionally harm a brother or a sister because of our arrogance or because of our pride, the light gets dimmer and eventually the light goes out and our witness for Christ is damaged. The next lesson is an inherited faith or a borrowed faith is no faith at all. So you are standing on quicksand, quicksand if you are living on an inherited faith or a borrowed faith. And some may say, but, but my parents prayed for me and took me to church, or, or my friends and I, we're, we're, we're part of a weekly Bible study, or, or I own a Bible and I bring it to church, but, but none of that is a saving faith. We, we can pray for people, we can take them to church, we can even study the Bible with them, but we can't give anyone our faith. 
nor can anyone bestow their faith upon us. Everyone has to develop a faith of their own. And we, we need the Holy Spirit. We need the filling of the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to the truth of God's word. And we need to be in constant study of, of the Bible and we need to be in daily prayer. Basically, if you take all of these steps on your own, you, you need to take all these steps on your own because no one can do it for you. And you have to participate in this procession and in this journey to the wedding feast. There can be no excuse like, well, someone's going to walk for me, and then I'm going to jump in at, at, at the end of the line, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cross the finish line with them. This is, this is not a team effort. This is, this is your personal walk. You can't piggyback off of someone else. And you can't be saved by someone else's faith. You either take the training wheels off of your bicycle and learn to ride that bike on your own, or you leave the training wheels on, and you know what happens when you have training wheels. It slows you down. And everyone else is going to race ahead. Everyone who's taken the training wheels off and has, have cultivated the faith, their faith, will just take off and race ahead of you and you'll be left behind. We all fall asleep in our faith. So this will affect all of us. It, if it affected Peter, James, and John, it's going to affect all of us. And it, it probably... And more than likely it already has, and it will in the future. And Because we will experience times of spiritual weakness and spiritual slumber, which leads to sin. And eventually for some, sleep sounds like a much better idea than anything else, and our alarm will go off, but we won't want to get up. And for some people, it's like they, they like hitting the snooze button on their spiritual life. Just, I'm going to hit the snooze button on, on Bible study, hit the snooze button on, on prayer, I'm going to hit the snooze button on, on doing my daily devotions, and eventually hitting that spiritual snooze button will become habitual, and you may not do it at all. So a life that's not built on Christ will find itself shut out on the last day. Christ is the foundation that leads to our salvation. Our own righteousness, our own works, our own traditions will not save us. Jesus' return, um, according to our perspective, is delayed, but he is coming. And he's going to come at an unexpected time like a thief in the night. So we'll, we'll all fall asleep in our faith. But in light of eternity and in light of how brief our lives really are, we, we can't afford to spiritually slumber for very long. And the fourth point, this is, sorry, this is a little long. <laughs> Profession as a believer in Christ without obedience to Christ is not a genuine faith in Christ. So when Jesus does return, his re return will reveal what's in everyone's hearts. Just like an immediate crisis will reveal to us who the courageous ones are and who the cowards are, who the ones who are duty-bound and those who are irresponsible, or those who are selfless versus those who are selfish. If a person has a superficial belief in Jesus, then the only thing that he's going to say to them on the last day is, I don't know you. You followed me from a distance, and maybe you saw where I was going, but you decided to go your own way. And we never got to know each other during that walk because you were too busy chasing after your own heart instead of after mine. And now your lamp is low on oil, and without a light, lighted lamp, then you're walking in the darkness of this world. So three questions to ask before we go out to meet the bridegroom. Do you have enough oil to get through the night? So every true believer has the Holy Spirit. So because you have the Holy Spirit, listen to him. Don't allow him to be the forgotten God of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit wants to change all of us to be more like Christ, and we need to let him do that. Otherwise, we won't be able to make it through the waiting and make it through the watching for Christ's return. And when it comes to spending time in God's word, quality is definitely more important than quantity. Um, if, you, if you spend an average of five minutes a week, maybe even five, five, minutes, a, five minutes a day um, or five days a week studying your Bible, you, the Holy Spirit will reveal things to you. Sometimes even you'll just, you'll just read one verse and suddenly the Holy Spirit will open your mind. And so continue to do that um, because when you do that that's filling your lamp with oil because the last thing we want to happen when Jesus returns is 
and, and whether he comes for us individually or whether he comes for us as, as a group is for us to suddenly realize that we don't have enough oil to get through the night. Second question, is your faith your own? So the illuminated lamp is our testimony. And non-believers, they're, they're not fools. They can see a difference between a, a genuine Christian who in their eyes most definitely comes across as different and strange in their eyes compared to their world. But they can also see a virtue signaling Christian, the, the person who may talk a lot about Jesus but then is, has one foot in the world because they like the world too much. So we can't, we can't deceive others into, into thinking that our lamps are full when they're not. So we shouldn't try to deceive ourselves. That, that'd be like running around with your Bible in your hands and, and without all the time without actually having opened it up at all. It's just for show. Um, so, an, so an outward profession of faith sounds great, especially when you're on the, on the mountaintops. But the true test of faith is when you're down in the dark valleys. And if you have a superficial faith or a borrowed faith or an inherited faith, that will fail you in the darkest of times. And once the door to heaven is shut, it's shut. So each, and each and every one of us, we know what a lost opportunity looks like and what it feels like. And a lack of faith will translate into a lost opportunity. And, and this is an opportunity we don't want to almost have but then lose. And the final question, does Jesus know you? So if your answer is no, then you need to get right with God and you need to begin following him and to work out your own salvation, as Paul says in Philippians 2.12, with fear and trembling because the Lord Jesus Christ could return at any moment. If your immediate answer is yes, I would say be very careful because you may be answering that, que that question from a place of, of potentially deceptive self-confidence. And, and you may be, may, maybe at this very moment your answer is a genuine yes, but what about after you walk out of here and something happens that sets you off? Or when you're at home tonight, or tomorrow, or next week, or in the privacy of your own home when you're all alone? The only acceptable answer, as Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 13, 5, is to examine ourselves to see whether we are in the faith. This means preaching the gospel to yourself every day. It means preaching the cross of Christ to yourself every single day. Because without doing that, without the message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, without the message of the cross of Jesus Christ, which replenishes us daily, our lamp will run out of oil in the middle of the night. So we are all invited to, to the wedding feast in the Father's house, but only the prepared will make it through the door before it's shut forever. So be prepared. Begin to prepare yourself. Be watchful and stay watchful and stay awake because the wedding feast could start at any time. So the... Nathaniel has prepared a final song for us. It's Sanctuary, and I know that Brother Austin was praying that we would sing that today. And, and it's an appropriate song to, to bring worship to a close because God is our sanctuary. If we keep him and remember him as our sanctuary, as we proceed along this path in the middle of the night with our lamps lit, that if we remember that he is our sanctuary, he truly will be the sanctuary and he will welcome us home to the wedding feast. So let's, let's stand as Nathaniel leads us in song. Lord. 
Lord, teach your children to stop the fighting, start uniting all as one. Let's get together, loving forever, a sanctuary for you. Prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living, a sanctuary for 